welcome to the Investor Coaching Show. I am Paul Winkler, talking money and investing. And uh, the stuff going on, things that I've seen during the course of the week that I thought I would share with you. It's always fun to do that. Okay, so uh, some news this week was they're figuring the Social Security COLA cost of living allowance is going to be 2.5% in 2025. So people are going to get a little bit of a raise. The average person somewhere in the neighborhood of about 1976 in benefits. That means they'll get another $49 per month. And a lot of people are just looking at that going, that's just not enough. That's not going to work. You know, they're dealing with prices and everybody's cost of living is different. If you look at your inflation rate for you, your family, it's going to be different from anybody else because your purchasing patterns are going to be different. You know, how do you substitute? Do you substitute other products for lower cost things when prices go up? Can you do that? What are your purchasing patterns as far as how much money do you put in housing versus energy versus entertainment, you know, whatever, or, you know, going out to eat or, or those types of things. It, it varies per person. So your inflation rate will differ between you and somebody else and your friends. It was really hard to get a beat on this. But they're, you know, they're just saying, hey, you know, the prices aren't rising as quickly. And, and you know, but retirees are still feeling the, the sting of paying for more for everything from groceries to insurance. I mean, look at some of the places around the country. I mean, even that where you live in the country is going to depend on what your inflation rate is because of insurance costs and now, health insurance, there was an article about health insurance this week, the cost of health insurance that companies are paying. What a mess. This is an industry that I came from, used to go door to door. I used to actually go door to door soliciting businesses on their health insurance plans and say, hey, I'd like to quote your health insurance. You know, and I would go and never never met a stranger, got to the point where you know, it was just like, I walk in any place, I don't care, you don't talk to anybody. But... Um, but I remember people telling me, hey, look, you know, kid, you know, kid <laughs> don't bother. Uh, even if I bought your health insurance plan for our people, if we looked at what the government is giving to my people, they pay less than if I paid for half of their insurance through you. That was very frustrating. Very frustrating. So the government getting involved in it really just, it just wreaked havoc on the system. But, you know, so... And, and you look at some places around the country where people are dealing with their homeowner's insurance going up so significantly. That's just, oh, man, driving them crazy. Uh, and the insurance companies are, yeah, they're just saying, oh, I can't do anything about it. But anyway, they're saying that politicians and economists, one person is being interviewed about this, and he says they're, they're crowing about reducing inflation to 2 or 3%, but that's on top of 20% inflation in prior years. This one guy from Illinois says, he says, they think it's good and it's not. And he says, he's been buying a case of beer for $18 and he compares that to his pre-pandemic price of $12. And I think he's probably increasing his beer consumption if he, not just after all of this, but yet frustrated, really frustrated. Now they did have an interesting study that shows that people tend to, I think it's because people tend to forget about stuff uh, that they tend to adjust to higher prices after a rise in inflation after about five years. It takes about five years for them to adjust. And I think that's in interesting because I think it's the same thing with stock markets. I think a lot of people forget about things that happened prior to five years. And I've talked about this before, that there's this five-year thing. Uh, we tend to forget things that happen. And for me, what I find is that investors think, hey, you know, everything that's been happening recently is going to continue. You know, that we complete patterns, as, as I like to say, in our minds on what's going to happen going forward. But I think people forget about, like, for example, real estate. You know, when real estate has gone through its collapses in the past, we forget that real estate not only goes up, but it can seriously come down. And I've had some people that say, you know, that's all I'm investing. I'm just, you know, putting all my money in that. And I've, and I, <laughs> did you experience it? And I'll name periods in history. And that, no, I wasn't investing in it at that point in time. So all they know is recent history. And they become a little bit bulletproof and feeling pretty isolated that they're not going to, nothing's going to happen to them. And I have to remind them by just, teaching them about, you know, because those who don't know history are doomed to repeat it, 
that you can have pretty significant declines in value on properties and real estate in general. You can have tax law changes. You have companies move out that used to be in a, in a particular area and created demand for properties in that area. You can have interest rate changes. You can have a lot of different things happen, demographic changes that change the supply and demand of properties. You can have supply increases that actually cause the value of properties to go down. There are a lot of things that can happen. And I think just people forget that. They forget that things are constantly in flux and constantly changing. And it's to their detriment. But this five year, I think it's a thing. You know, one of the things that I've I've talked about recently, and I went back and revisited the numbers, is you know, target date funds, you know, will have a lot of larger companies in it, right? You know, I've talked about that before, where if you go to the default plan choice in your 401k, it's typically a pre-allocated portfolio put together by the mutual fund company. And I think mutual fund companies are as myopic as anything. You know, they forget market and, and markets what they've done in the past. And I think it's partly because, hey, you know, we'll give the people what they want. If people look around and they see that big companies, big tech companies have done well recently, they'll demand more of it because they want the, the good investments. I want something that's doing well. That's what they'll say. That's doing well. I want the investments that are doing well. And I'll always have to correct them and go, no, have done well. We need to put this in the past tense. Because yeah, this is the most common mistake that investors make. They buy based on past performance. And it's unbelievable to me that investment advisors recommend funds based on that. Now look at portfolios and go, well, why is that in there? Well, you know, the past performance is really good. And, and, you know, they'll look at track record. And, you know, like I was talking about with the 401ks, they'll take away funds that had poorer performance and then they replace it with funds that had better performance in most recent years. And, and the thing is, is, that'd be great if you could go back and relive history. There was a study of pension plans. They did that. And they had these funds that outperformed and they had a, a line up high and they had a line down lower. And the line up high was showing the past performance of a certain group of funds that were being added to the pension. The line below was the funds that they were replacing. In other words, the returns of the funds that they were putting into the pension had exceeded the funds that they were getting rid of, which to most people you would say, well, that makes sense. Get rid of the losers and put the winners in there. The funds that have performed well, let's put them in the pension plan because that's what I want. I want better performing funds, right? Well, the funny thing is the two lines, when they went forward in history, they crossed. So the one that was on top went to the bottom. The one that was on the bottom went to the top. And what they were basically pointing out in the pension study is that the top performing funds from the past ended up underperforming the funds that they replaced. So they basically shot themselves in the foot. And yet they felt like they were doing the best thing, which is funny. Now, if you look at, for example, target day funds and like, you know, Vanguard, for example, they have target 2040, 2050, 2045 funds. You know, they have different years that you're going to retire. If you look at the holdings of those funds, that the top holding, the top stock holding will be their total stock market index fund. That's what they hold. And if you look at the marketing on it, it gives you the access of the entire market. And technically, they're not lying about that because they have 3,653 stocks in that portfolio. And you think, well, that's the whole market in the U.S., pretty much, for publicly traded companies. But if you look at the holdings and dig down, you see that Apple's the biggest holding, Microsoft the second biggest, NVIDIA the next biggest holding, Amazon, according to Morningstar, Meta, Alphabet, Berkshire, Eli Lilly, Alphabet, and Broadcom. Those are the top 10 holdings. So if you look at Apple, it's 6.14% of the portfolio. If you look at Microsoft, it's, it's about six, uh, just, just a little bit lower than Apple. If you look at NVIDIA, it's just above 5% of the portfolio. And you go down and you add those all up, you notice that 10 companies make up 30% of the value of the portfolio. 10 companies. Another way to put that is that 0.2% of the companies held make up 30% of the portfolio. Just think about that. 
2% of the companies make up 30% of the portfolio. And you go, well, you know, well, so? Well, the average P.E. ratio, what price you're paying for every dollar of earnings, historically for the S&P 500, is about 16 the average P.E. on the companies, those top 10 holdings, is 27.75. So it is almost $27. It's almost $30 for every dollar of earnings versus the historic average for the S&P 500 at 16. And you go, what could go wrong? <laughs> They're almost double the S&P 500. What could go wrong? Oh, I don't know. I, I can't imagine. <laughs> And, and yet this is what investors in their 401ks. Now, why isn't anybody upset? Because the problem hasn't happened yet. It's just like in the late 90s. Nobody was upset about, and these holdings, you know, read them. Apple, Microsoft, NVIDIA, you know, Amazon, you could, you could argue is very technology-based. Alphabet, definitely technology-based. Uh, Broadcom, you know, so you have Alphabet Class A and Class C. There, there are going to be two holdings in there, but you know, there it's all technology, right? And you look at this and go, well, what could you know? Well, when we had the tech drop, and I'm not saying this is good, what's going to happen. I'm just saying this is what could happen. It has happened. You had an 80 percent drop. You're an investor, and you're happy while everything's great until the bottom drops out and then you go, I can't retire. I can't retire because my portfolio has dropped through the ground. And most people don't recognize this is happening. This is a huge percentage, 10 stocks making up about 30% of a portfolio of a fund. And these stocks on average are selling for double the historic average when you look at price that you're paying for every dollar of earnings. And that's one of the ways that we look at these things. One of the metrics that we want to look at. You know, so it, it's, you know, you just go, gosh, this is crazy. This is an accident waiting to happen. And the problem is people will say, well, if it starts to look bad, I'll get out. And so that's what people would say to me. And I go, no, here's what happens. When bad news comes out, not only do you know the bad news, you know, but everybody else does that's possibly going to buy your fund off of you or the stocks underlying your fund that they're going to buy those things. And guess what? If you know the information and they know the information, they don't want to pay the old high price anymore. That doesn't make any sense. So... The, 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 the thing to do is this, go get diversified before the accident happens. This is why I always tell people when we, when we look at a 401k, we're looking at investments, we're looking at these things because we've got to make sure that we proactively do something before it's too late. Because once the news comes out that, you know, something is not quite what we thought it was going to be, you can't get out fast enough. And that is why I think it's so critical just to be proactive, make sure that you know, you're diversified in various areas. People say, hey, look, this is diversified. And technically it is. You know, you're looking at almost 3,700 companies in this portfolio. But remember, diversification doesn't just mean I own a lot of things. I have to have a significant amount of money in the other companies in the portfolio. I can't just have exposure to them and have 0.0001% of my money in one of the stocks. You see what I mean? So, you know, that's where we run into problems. I am Paul Winkler. You're listening to the Investor Coaching Show right here on Supertalk 99.7 WTN. That's why we're doing it. PaulWinkler.com. Go to the website. We take a look at what's going on. You want to do this before something happens, not after. 888-825-5225. 